on this edition of 219 West. No lifeline for a drowning Brooklyn industry. And from our 219 West archives, how the sports industry discriminates against women. Welcome to 219 West, I'm K. Dominic McKenzie. Now it may seem a bit chilly to talk about fishing, but it's a year-round business for people who make their living off the waters of Chief's Head Bay. Now most would be surprised to know that the storied neighborhood at the far end of Brooklyn is actually named after a fish that once lived in the body of the water on the southernmost tip of the borough. Like the Chief's Head fish, the community's once booming fishing industry might soon be wiped out thanks to increasing government regulations. Despite complaints from local fishermen, government agencies have maintained their stand. It was admittedly a little warmer when Naomi Yane took the bait and went to find out why. Okay. 62-year-old commercial fisherman Joe Loro has been in the business since he was 13, working on his father's fishing boat on Sheep's Head Bay. Joe's family came to America from Sorrento in August of 1905. My dad and his family, they came from Italy and um, landed at Ellis Island, and they ended up in Coney Island, which is only uh, 10 miles away. So as they were coming in with the ship, they saw the area, and they were commercial fishermen, and... Um, in the Mediterranean, southern Italy. And uh, so they got back into the fishing business right away. In 1947, the Loro family bought Stella Maris bait and tackle shop. Stella Maris means star of the sea. It's one of two bait and tackle shops still in business on Emmons Avenue. There used to be about eight. Back then it was just uh, a bigger business. Um, it seems like not as many people are interested in it. I don't know if, if, if it's because the uh, Prices have gone up, but bait, tackle, line, everything to go out on a boat is a lot more money. So um, I think everything contributes to it and um, the fact that you're not allowed to keep as many fish. Sheep's Head Bay is home to several types of fishing, including commercial and recreational. Commercial fishing is done on a larger scale with the end goal of market selling, while recreational fishing is done for pleasure or sport. But according to local fishermen, increasing regulations on fishing catch is forcing fishermen into early retirement. They just keep choking in. It's very hard to make a, a living with what we're allowed to catch. Me and my partner both have our own licenses, so we're allowed 50 fish. But we're only allowed to go out and catch 25 at a time, come in, bring them, tie them to the dock, and then go out and catch the other 25, which is... Um, Kind of silly to me, no matter what businesses you're in, conservation or commercial fishing. It's more time, more money for fuel. It's um, not too smart. Government agencies like the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration say it's necessary to impose regulations on fishing to avoid overfishing, which happens when the stock is depleted below a level that's not sustainable. Both commercial and recreational fishing are regulated by the Magnuson Stevens Fishery Conservation and Management Plan. In the last 10 years, regulations for both commercial and recreational fishing has moved to more science based limits. We have scientists, we have biologists that uh, determine whether um, areas are overfished. We have fishery management councils, and uh, with the fishery management councils, they look at the numbers and they take the recommendations from the scientists and from the biologists and then they determine whether the fishery should keep on going, what the size limit should be, um, what the uh, amount should be that we take out of the ocean. Retired party boat captain Richard Arneman worked his way up on his father's boat from bait boy to captain. For years, Arneman tried to keep the family business afloat and ultimately said goodbye to the fishing industry last year. He now works as a plumber to make ends meet. He agrees there should be restrictions on commercial fishing instead of recreational. They should be putting the restrictions on the draggers and, and so on and people who fish on the pier that don't 
don't apply by the rules. Us on our boats, we try to obey by the rules. No matter how tough they are or not in our favor, we obey by the rules. And uh, they're just too tight of restrictions for us to really keep our boats afloat. By the late 19th century, the south shore of Brooklyn was a booming resort town that comprised Brighton Beach, Manhattan Beach, Coney Island, and Sheepshead Bay, which was destined to house a fishing industry. One of the first people to move in there, Benjamin Freeman it was his name. And Mr. Freeman, he called the area Sheepshead Bay because of the abundance of a, sh a fish in the local waters called the sheep's head. And the teeth of the sheep's head fish resembled the teeth of a sheep. Hence, that's how the, the bay and the neighborhood got its name. Most people don't know that. By the 1920s and 30s, the fishing industry began to take shape as a way to make a living. The 1940s and 50s saw their first charter boats for day fishing. Today, they're known as party boats, and the industry grew from there. By the 1940s and 50s, you had I would guess between 40 and 50 for charter fishing boats, all docked along the piers along Sheepshead Bay on Emmons Avenue. You can go down to the water in, on Emmons Avenue and wait for the around 4 o'clock in the afternoon when the day-long fishing trips would come in, and you can buy the fish right off the boats. They used to deal directly with the, the restaurants themselves or or the uh, fish stores. Back then, each fish store had their own truck, so it was nothing for them to stop here, get some fish here, get some fish in Sheepshead Bay, get some fish out of Flatbush Avenue, you know. Today, the chain of events is a little different for Loro. He sells all his fish to one dealer, who then sells to restaurants and fish stores. It's just easier that way, because um, we have to make the two trips a day instead of one, and um, we don't have the tanks in our truck which we would put if we could do it, but it becomes too many hours a day. So we sell to one, one wholesaler. He buys all our fish, and he uh, delivers them to the fish stores and the restaurants. Loro says that being a fisherman was once a lucrative career where you could make at least $100,000 a year. That number has been cut in half, and he blames tighter restrictions. Recreational fishing limits the number of species, while commercial fishing limits by number of days at sea as well as number of species. U.S. fisheries contributed just under $208 billion in sales, a drop from 2014 of $214 billion, according to the U.S. Fisheries Economics 2015 report. Fisheries jobs are also down to 12 percent. No, I think it's a balance. There's a balance between what we can take and what we have to leave uh, for the future. And with that, it goes back in sustainability. Um, the whole purpose of um, um, what we do is to make sure that the fishermen and the American people can get as much as they can out of the ocean, but at a level that we can make it sustainable and keep it sustainable um, for, for years to come. Bay Improvement Group President Steve Barrison said Sheepshead Bay has seen a decrease in fishing fleets from 30 to 40 boats to half a dozen boats and organizations like his work to bring attention to the waterfront and preserve the livelihood of this coastal community. The city of New York has turned their back on an industry worth millions of dollars that provided thousands of jobs. If you chip away at the fleet, which serviced a couple of thousand employees and millions of dollars in revenue for the city, and instead change the zoning and allow improper waterfront shopping, which is not part of what the zoning is or what the waterfront culture is, be recreation, entertainment, and visitation. If you do that, you are turning your back on an industry that generates millions of dollars in revenue and thousands of jobs for New York, and you have instead co-ops and condos, which are great and nice, but they don't generate nearly the revenue of those thousands of jobs. I like to see Sheeps of Bay come back and thrive again. I mean, it's thriving now. We have a lot of restaurants. That's pretty good if you want to bring your family out to eat, but nobody comes down for the fishing boats no more. For 219 West, I'm Naomi Yanni. Thanks, Naomi. We'll be right back. Welcome back. This fall, we mark our 10th year on the air, but we've decided to start that celebration a bit early. These next three stories from our 219 West archives are about women athletes. March is Women's History Month, and also March Madness. So we thought revisiting women and sport seemed appropriate. 
Title IX is a groundbreaking law that prohibits gender discrimination in schools and opened the door for women and girls to participate in sports. Now, two years ago, 219 West commemorated the 45th anniversary of that landmark legislation. Joaquin Torres reported that women athletes then were still playing on an uneven field, earning much less than men in the same sport. Around here, Friday night football means something different. One of the girls running drills is 10-year-old Harry, who says she has a dream. My friend once asked me, what are you going to be like in like 20 years? And I said, hopefully a professional soccer player on the women's U.S. team. But Harry already knows it won't be easy. And it's not just the competition that worries her. I once heard that women get paid less, even though they work a little harder. Okay. Do you think it's fair? Not really. Because, like, most people say that men are usually stronger than women, which is not very fair. I mean, that both. Like, I can beat up my bro both my brothers. Oh. Like. The reality for professional female players is worse than Harry realizes. The pay ceiling, the maximum amount a player can earn in the Women's National Soccer League, is just $41,700 for a season. The minimum, just $15,000, which means most players can't even afford their living expenses. National team players, for sure, they can. But um, like for me, I have a job in the off season since our season is like so short. These girls are setting that standard of you know pushing for the wages to be higher, so that these young kids that are watching and want to dream of being a professional athlete can be a professional athlete and get the wages they deserve. Everywhere we go. On a recent Sunday afternoon, fans took the bus from New York to New Jersey for a Sky Blue season home opener. The popularity of female soccer in America is growing, but the wage gap between men and women is huge. On average, a male soccer player earns around $300,000 a year. That's more than the salary cap for a whole team in the women's league. There's definitely a, a huge gap in the, uh, the wage structure between males and females, and it's unfortunate. It's very tough for the Sky Blue players, not just them, but every player in NWSL, because the wages on a yearly basis are not enough. It's getting better, but it's not enough. Raquel Rodriguez scored a winning goal in Blue's victory against Kansas City. Rodriguez is from Costa Rica. There, she says, things are even worse. There isn't even a professional women's soccer league. There's no professional soccer, that means there's no salary whatsoever. So, and I'm here and, you know, when you see the national team players, for example, you know, fight for equal, equal pay, um, there's a, of course there's a point in that, you know, but then my background, I'm like, well, I've never earned money for doing this. Women in the national team make about 40% of what their male counterparts do. But the difference is higher when we are talking about price money. Men team got 9 million just for advancing beyond the 60s in the last World Cup, while women earn two million for winning the World Tournament. The staggering wage gap led the national women's team to sue U.S. soccer, but last year a judge ruled in the Federation's favor. That's obviously something that we're fighting to, to close the gap, and it's, it's a tough battle, and we obviously went through a very public one, and so we just got to keep fighting, and as uh, women, we just need to stand together and keep fighting for, for what we believe we are valued at. And the gap isn't just in soccer. Salaries in women's basketball are not a slam dunk either. The highest salary in the WNBA is around $100,000. That's not even close to the NBA, where many players earn millions. Tim Quarterman of the Portland Trail Blazers earned more than half a million dollars last year for playing only 80 minutes. It's crazy, but there's so much more money involved in the NBA, so they have more to go around. Julian Viani, who played professional basketball in Armenia after college, says American players are valued more overseas than in their own country. You're an American and you go overseas to play, usually you're the highest paid player, just because <laughs> you're American. If you go to the highest league in, in Europe, if you go to like a Russia, you know, the women will be paid $900,000 a year there. <laughs> the wage disparity is seen throughout professional women's sports. In the ring, she is known as Amanda the Real Deal Serrano. She is the only woman in boxing history to win world championships in five different divisions. But despite her dominance in the sport, 
she earns only a fraction of what male boxers make. We're not fighting only in the ring, we're fighting outside to, to try to you know, make money different, different places. On the average, a world champion can make a million dollars. A female fighter would not make a hundred thousand. And still, the WBA female junior featherweight champion of the world. Amanda's recordless showtime to air the January fight between Serrano and Jasmine Rivas as the top match of the card. It was the first time in a decade a women's fight headlined a national boxing broadcast. She earned just $200,000. The biggest boxing event in 2017. One month later, Amanda's childhood idol, Oscar de la Hoya, came to New York to promote a men's fight between Saul Alvarez and Julio Cesar Chavez. Canelo Alvarez took home more than $36 million. So we do sell tickets. I think we are an attraction. You know, we, we can fight. So I don't understand why uh, we're not getting equal, equal pay. You know, I get paid an amount of the uh, Pacquiao's corner, man. <laughs> Top female athletes feel they should be paid like their male counterparts. But the reality is many of them are fighting just to make the kind of money that would allow them to live from playing their sport. For Two Night in West, I'm Joaquin Torres in Pescataway, New Jersey. You have to eat meat to gain muscle, right? Well, back in 2012, Sarah Kazadi brought you this story about a Brooklyn woman who devoted her life to being a lean green machine. Competitor number 14 from Brooklyn, New York, Jaina Malik. <laughs> Jaina Malik is 123 pounds of pure muscle. Most of the time, you can find her in the gym chiseling her physique. But it isn't just for show. At 19, she saw a bodybuilding contest on TV. She's been competing professionally ever since. I hear a lot of people asking, why do I do it? Or why do I put myself through it? It's the high I get on stage when I'm flexing and when I'm entertaining the crowd. Malik's 14th competition is at the end of March. She spent the three months before the show training and focusing on her diet. And while most of her opponents bulk up on beef, she will eat tofu. The soybean product counts for almost 90% of Malik's strictly vegan diet. The 32-year-old was born to vegan parents and has been vegan her entire life. People here vegan, they're, wait, they're waiting to see somebody who's skinny or sickly looking or not muscular. So I blow people's minds away when they see me and knowing I'm a, a, a vegan and I'm bodybuilding and I have this much and I was able to put muscle like this. While training, Malik eats six meals a day from 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. As a vegan, she doesn't eat meat, dairy, or anything else that comes from animals. But a vegan diet alone isn't enough for her to physically match up to her competition. Most bodybuilders chow down on red meat, poultry, and eggs. Malik's food doesn't have the same amount of proteins and nutrients. That's where the laundry list of supplements comes in. BCAAs, um, the silica, chlorial silver, vitamin C, B12, B complex, calcium, magnesium, zinc, oh, who, vitamin E. All the supplements may help level the playing field, but a vegan diet still poses a challenge for athletes who need all the energy they can get. Restricting any foods, it can make it harder to meet your energy needs. And if you're a bodybuilder, if you're an athlete, your needs are higher. So restricting any kind of food certainly makes that, that more difficult. Brooke Paul has spent years tailoring nutrition and training regimens for athletes. Though it may be tough, she says they can maintain a vegan diet with the right help. If you're going to be a vegan athlete, you probably should be doing it with some sort of supervision or at least, you know, meet with an expert, meet with a dietitian um, so that you're, you're sure to cover your bases in terms of your nutrients. See right here? Malik has yet to find a doctor who specializes in vegans and bodybuilding. It's one of the reasons why she puts her nutrition in her own hands. A lot of time when I go to doctors or tell me anything about what I'm doing for bodybuilding, they think it's not healthy or safe. I don't want to hear that, so basically I do it on my own. <laughs> Though Jahina Malik may be one of the very few professional athletes who've been vegan since birth, she's definitely not the only vegan athlete out there. In different sports, athletes past and present have picked a vegan diet. Some of the more famous ones are Olympic track star Carl Lewis, Tennis Hall of Famer Martina Navratilova, and MMA fighter Jake Shields. Amira Lamb, one of Malik's good friends, was on that list too. 
But after 10 years as a vegan, the exercise instructor and personal trainer changed her diet. My health was deteriorating and my skin, um, I had a lot of acne. Uh, my energy levels were waning. I, in order to work, I needed to rely on stimulants. So like coffee, <laughs> like a lot of coffee. Lamb spoke with various doctors before leaving veganism. After learning more about the diet's possible dangers, she founded Holistic Hadi, a nutrition company which uses whole foods and exercise to build healthy bodies. There's no people um, historically that actually survived that were vegan. Everyone has always been some type of carnivore or omnivore. Even if they were eating insects or eating dairy, veganism isn't natural in my opinion. Though the opinions on veganism vary, one thing is for sure, this diet will cost you. All my money goes to food, all my money goes to supplements. You would think vegan food will be cheaper because it's not crap in it, but it's that much more expensive. My pockets are normally empty. She spends most of her money at this health food store in Manhattan. She's been visiting for over a decade. This pig has been up here for about what, eight years now? We put it because we know that she has uh, taken the other route. You know, she's a vegan and she's bodybuilding and she looks good and she always fit. So as a loyal customer and a friend, we decided to put her there and, you know, to support her. Though some people admire what she does, Malik is well aware of the stereotypes that come with being a female bodybuilder. They look like a man, um, it, let alone if they just have muscles or, or guys think I'm scary. Um, guys think I could finish press them. <laughs> Her muscles often draw stares and people assume she takes steroids. Many bodybuilders openly use the muscle enhancers, which are not banned in the sport. Yeah, the majority are on it, but that's the choice. You ain't gonna find old natural Mr. Miss Olympia. That's, that's how it is. So I'm on natural, never use steroids, but of course the thought always go in my mind. Yeah. If I were to, I would be looking like a beast. But <laughs> The goal is to look like a winner on March 31st. The show is quickly approaching, and they'll put all of her training to the test. Sarah Kazadi for 219 West. And finally, a story about some young women who were armed and considered extremely dangerous. They're armed wrestlers who share one passion, the thrill of pinning their opponents on the table. Here's Samantha Stark. Although people think that arm wrestling is a drinking game for macho thugs, it's actually an internationally recognized competitive sport. And like many major sports, it has a small but fierce female division. A tight-knit group of New York City's female arm wrestlers practice every week in a queen's basement. You know, when I tell people I'm going to arm wrestling practice, they look at me like I got 10 hands, like what? Do you guys get drunk? Do you guys, you know, start grunting? Like we're not, you know, barbarians. We don't like, uh, 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 like we don't grunt. We're not like that. The Queensboro tournament that I went to, I like punched the table because I was so mad and like some, a couple people yelled at me about it. Like, what are you doing? You have to be ladylike. And I was just like, I'm sorry. It got to my head. I was upset because somebody beat me. One female arm wrestler is conspicuously absent from this practice. My name is Marlene Viper Webb. I'm from um, South Luzon Park, New York. I'm 22, bartender. I'm a female arm wrestler and try to be the best of the best. And currently, I'm doing all right in New York. I'm like first place currently. It's true. Ask anyone in the arm wrestling world. Merlene Barouette is probably the best arm wrestler in the city right now. Merlene, she's the best in the country. No one, no one that can beat her in New York today. Merlene started arm wrestling in the 11th grade when her science teacher, who was also a professional arm wrestler, invited her to a tournament. She took second. And I have a feeling had I took first, I never would have become an arm wrestler. But I took second and I can't take second. Merlene practices every week, too. She's the only girl in New York, uh, yeah, New York that trains with guys, and with the best ones, too, at that. But Merlene takes her female competition seriously. We're a wrestler, and you're from New York. You're a beast. I'm at the Port Authority bus terminal in Manhattan, where the city's best arm wrestlers have gathered. Thousands of people pass through the terminal on their way to work. But these strong arms are here to compete in the 32nd annual Empire State Golden Arms Tournament of Champions. 
I'm hoping to win today, win the tournament the, for the women. Basically, my strategy is to do a top roll. It's, uh, when you, it's like when you push your wrist this way and go back. As for Merlene, she's not as cool as she seems. Like, I'm always nervous before matches. Nervous, nervous, nervous. And when once the girls are being called, I, I have to put on my hoodie because I'm cold. But when I'm on the table, I don't really hear the refs. And I'm, I'm, all I'm listening for is good. Ready, go. March. At the tournament, the other women hang out, get advice between matches, and of course, compete. Ready, go. Match. Ready, go. Match. Ready, go. Watch your elbow, Miss Boom. Match. Merlene takes all three divisions. Her wins mean others face disappointment. The champion. Merlene's not crowing over her victory. She's already preparing for her next big challenge, the World Championships. And I'm like, of course, I want to win World several times. If I can, just win it once and win it again and win it again and win it again. At least four times. Maybe then I'll be like, oh, I think I've had enough of <laughs> For 219 West, I'm Samantha Stark. And that's it for this edition of 219 West. I'm K. Dominic McKenzie. See you next time with more stories from New York and beyond.